So I'm going to kick off with some stuff around your mother wound. So for those of you who are a bit unsure about what a mother wound is, essentially, if your mum is critical, controlling, competitive, or she's emotionally absent for whatever reason, and that can be anything from addiction, bereavement, mental health issues, postpartum depression, trauma, her own mother wound, there can be many, many reasons why mums are like this. It can create a relationship with her that constantly undermines you. And that can mean that you end up feeling unworthy, unlovable, like you have to put everybody else first, that it's hard to have boundaries or say no to things. And you might feel abandoned or neglected in some way. It might be hard to trust other people. There are lots of wounds that kind of stem from that, but we call that collection of wounds that mother wound. And when we become mums ourselves or even start thinking about becoming mums the problem that we have is that our internalized idea of a mother is going to be our own and if we have a difficult and bad relationship with her then we have this archetype of having a bad mother and the question then becomes are are we going to be a bad mother Or do we have to swing in the opposite direction and try to be the best mother we can be by doing everything that mum doesn't? And it sounds like a great idea in theory, but I'm going to tell you why it's not. (laughs) Um, Essentially, it comes down to this. If you find your mum is really, really neglectful and really abandoning and really emotionally absent, You might find yourself constantly wishing for her to be around, being supportive, wanting to be the type of mum that does that. But it's really easy when you think, I don't want to be like my mum, to swing to completely the opposite side of the pendulum. And what's at the other side of that pendulum? Helicopter parenting, that smothering, overbearing mum that can make it very, very hard for that child to have any kind of freedom, to have any kind of space. And sometimes what I see in my work is that one generation will be neglectful, one will be smothering, and then it will be neglectful again, and then it will be smothering because each of them are trying to find something in the middle, but they're just swinging back and forth, back and forth between these two positions. And actually what we're looking for is to have enough confidence in ourselves, to be settled enough in ourselves, to be able to be okay with making some mistakes, to be okay with our children taking some risks, to be able to be emotionally available for them, but also to give them a bit of space to do some things for themselves. And that can feel really hard to navigate. So hard, in fact, that I know that there's a significant portion of you within um, my group who have made the decision never to have children because the thought of having children and bringing this stuff up is just too much. Incorporating that identity of mum can feel too much to, to kind of do and, and think about. So one of the things that I would say is when you're navigating matrescence, try not to think about it in opposition to your mum. Don't try thinking about it in terms of how do I not want to be like my mother? because that's going to be what causes that swing. Another way of thinking about it is to think about it in terms of what qualities do I want my child to have? And I thought about this because when I was pregnant, we went along to some parenting classes and there was this wonderful poem called You Live What You Learn. And it was things like, if a child lives with criticism, he learns to be critical. If a child lives with love, she learns to be loving. Yeah. 
And I've always thought that one of the really good things to do is to think about what kind of child do you want? Do you want a child that's confident? Do you want a child that's loving? Do you want a child that's kind? Do you want a child that is focused? Do you want a child that enjoys playing? What things do you want that child to be? Because what you can think about them as is a bit like in Sleeping Beauty, where those fairies give Sleeping Beauty those gifts, yeah? Those wonderful qualities. So what you're thinking about now is not about mum at all. What you're thinking is, how do I give this gift of confidence to my child? And then that opens up a whole new way of thinking about it. Because actually to give that child confidence, it might be giving them a bit of space to climb a tree. It might be holding their hand whilst they're walking along a wall and then letting them jump off by themselves at the end, even if they fall, even if they scrape their knee, you know. And it's about listening to their ideas and validating them. And then we start to see how we can be present for that child, for our child to develop those qualities. You know, if you want your child to be loving, how do you show them that they're loved every day? How do you live up to that? Because then what you get are these qualities that you try to live up to every day. And that stops that swing. It stops that back and forth. And it's a really lovely way of thinking about things. Because, you know, this stuff can bring up really, really strong feelings for us, especially if we get into that conflict space. And as soon as we do that, as soon as we start thinking, I don't want to be like my mum, not only is that oppositional, not only is that conflict, you're now in your stress response. You're either going to want to run away from this, you're going to want to fight it. You're going to think, oh, my God, what do I do? And you're just freezing or, oh, my God, it's just inevitable. It's just going to happen to me anyway. And, and then you've gone into your faint response. And what we don't want is you starting your relationship with your child in a stress response, because that's not good for you. And it's not good for helping your child attach to you in a way that's secure and healthy, because what we want to do is we want to move children who are born into families that have that intergenerational transmission of mother wounds from having that predisposition to having an anxious attachment pattern and the anxiety that stays with them for the rest of their lives unless they heal this which is what you know many of the women I work with are there for to heal that attachment pattern we want them to be secure we want them to be happy we want them to feel resilient so that if life happens which inevitably will and they get knocked off their horse they fall over and cut their knee they say something that upsets a friend that they have the tools to deal with it because they're confident, they're kind, they know how to repair that relationship because you've built those concepts and those values for them to work from. And that's so important in not passing stuff on. And in terms of yourself, looking at your mother wound and thinking about how that affects you will help you to stop passing on those things because when we have mother wounds of our own, it's so easy to, to drop into criticism or competition or just being controlling because we're feeling a bit anxious and we just want everything to go right. And then we slip into that perfectionism. And then we find that we're not emotionally present because we're thinking about all the things that could go wrong. And this overthinking just is like a cloud over your head that's really hard to, to kind of see a way forward. So I think from, from my point of view, the value in healing your mother wound is not only do you repair your own mental health, but it stops that transmission because it helps you to think about things in a different way. And so when you do get those meetings, when you do get those bad days, when you do have the days when everyone would be emotionally absent when you're sick, when you've got the flu, when you've got COVID, you know, if something bad happens, you know that you can come back from that. Because if you're not emotionally absent all the time and you repair 
that relationship and that trust after these things happen, your child will learn to do the same in their own relationships because you're modeling for him. And that is so, so valuable. So that's my little jaunt into the mother wound. Keely, are you going to tell us? I could, literally, I could literally just like everybody just said, I'm not nodding and I'm like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And it's really, really interesting because actually I feel like our family has gone from my auntie doesn't want children, etc. because she can't deal with the mother wounds and, and the whole family thing to then, you know, kind of just everybody having so many issues because they've never dealt with their mother wound. And that kind of coming to now this generation, I, I still have problems, but as I parent and try and parent my child, I do try and be very open and honest because actually I have to model that behavior. Even the other day I was in the car and I was overwhelmed and like I just had some fog and I couldn't get my words. I was like, uh, uh. I said, do you know, I said, she's called Liliana, but I, Lil's, I was like, Lil, I just need two minutes because I literally had not stringed a sentence together in my brain. <laughs> I was like, I can't give you an answer. And so I carried on driving and then like two minutes passed and she was like, you've had your two minutes. Can you think yet? <laughs> but ultimately... <laughs> we laughed about it but I just had to explain to her that that sometimes there's just so much going on that you can't literally string a sentence together or whether it's kind of you know all the different things that go on but yeah you've just got a model from from the front really haven't you for them to understand how to manage with situations so yes I completely agree with everything you just said and more and I could talk about that for ages but I'm here to talk about identity because to me that was really the biggest scariest transition so my background I used to run pubs so when I was actually pregnant with Liliana we were running a really busy pub um I don't know if anyone believes in kind of haunted ghosts and stuff but it was meant to be a big haunted medieval pub um and it was really really busy we we were working 16 hours a day seven days a week at times doing all the different roles as you do in the hospitality trade and yeah to kind of have this business and kind of success and independence and and everything else to then be like right you're off now that's it put your feet up your mum and that switch was just big big as in a really big word big and for me that identity shift was um was quite daunting and I remember coming home from the hospital and she was in the carry cot or the chair seat even whatever they're called car seat and I put her on the sofa and I was looking at her and she's all cute and little and then I thought oh I really need to go to the shop and my husband was there but ultimately as you do you just think miss independent as I am like oh we need milk and then I turned around and I went to go and I was like oh like there's a baby that I need to now not leave I can't just do what I need to do and and that kind of lack of control I suppose or even that sense of me you know I can't just nip out now because I have this little person that I need to take everywhere with me and care for and keep alive ultimately so it was a huge change for me and not always that simple I suppose so yeah I suppose what I'd like to highlight today is kind of that that lack of sense of control the the sense of self and who I am and and the freedom that kind of brings with it so whether you kind of aren't really career focused but maybe you are competitive in a, in a sport of some description you know let's just say I mean I'm not particularly sporty but let's just say I was a swimmer and I'm sure most swimmers kind of go and train you know I don't know four or five times a week maybe and then you have a baby and it's like oh well who has baby now I need to you know, the the likelihood is you're either breastfeeding and that means it's near enough no-no unless someone's going to sit with a baby and watch you swim while you train. So you you then kind of lose your hobbies and your interests that you did. And for me, I couldn't just go back to the pub and work because the needs of a child is just so great. You, You just lose that kind of sense of person, I suppose. And when you kind of have the the transition into motherhood and the control element of you know babies kind of rule the roost a little bit (laughs) you don't you don't really get a say I suppose 
um, when a baby decides that they're hungry because one minute they could be feeding once every hour and next they're feeding once every 20 minutes or you know but for an hour so all of a sudden you know the first initial part you could be kind of sofa bound realistically and just surviving off snacks inside so that control element just really disappears and and I think people can warn you about the transition and you kind of hear everyone's got something to say when you're pregnant haven't they they've all got a a top tip on how to survive and get through etc but the reality I think is very 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 different and and I think it's different for everybody because we all live very individual lives and and bespoke I suppose so yeah to then kind of have this complete change and I and I also feel like although I'm talking about identity your identity as a mum to your partner instead of you know if we're talking first child that kind of you're not you anymore your body's changed your mental kind of capacity's changed and you're tired and and just learning usually on the job everything is new and everything is learning normally and you know we wing it ultimately don't we mums most of the time because you know the baby's crying they can't talk and you're like oh do you need have you pooed have you weed do you need feeding like what's going on do you want some comfort um so everything is a bit of a guessing game and I think that just gives a whole kind of element of potential low self-esteem potential kind of um lack of self-worth even just because it's like well who am I anymore what what does it matter and you don't really get that opportunity to always have that self-care you know the luxury is having a shower sometimes and the luxury is having a hot cup of tea or coffee whatever your kind of thing may be and most of the time you don't even finish it um and it's not that kids are really bad or the experience isn't absolutely amazing because for me the most precious time of motherhood is that initial stage it's kind of that's my favorite that's like if I could literally give birth and have a child for like that four months at the beginning that's where I thrive and love it so so much whereas some mums like wish they could have a child not do the birth and not do the first four or five months (laughs) and then do like the next stage and so I think everyone's very very different in that kind of process and I know Charlotte you've got twins so yeah for you I mean how was your identity (laughs) and the shift should we say um I think it was a bit of a shock shall we say um back then they didn't do scans so early so my first scan was at 20 weeks before that they'd heard a heartbeat so they were quite happy with that. I've been being quite sick, but other than that, you know, no real signs of anything. 20 weeks comes, I'm having my scan and suddenly everybody just kind of erupts. So at this point, I'm a little bit scared. I'm a little bit like, oh, what's happening here? And then suddenly the ultrasound thing swings around and I'm showing the fact that I've got twins. At this point, my husband's in danger of like passing out. You know, it's one thing being told you're going to be a dad and then another thing to be told is twins. And um, yeah, they they came 15 weeks later. So they were they were preemie babies. And suddenly we we had the kind of whole tubes and ventilators experience, which was um, was quite difficult. Um, So I actually went from being one person to kind of being a triad rather than a dyad. And that was really, really hard because it's then who do you spend time with? Am I constantly going to feel guilty because this one wants something and then I go to tend to them and then the other one cries and then I haven't got six hands, you know. Um, that that was quite hard, actually. And, of course, there was the part of me that didn't want to be my own mum, the part of me that had kind of, had this vision this image of me with a baby (laughs) rather than two thinking how the hell am I going to do this I can't even get the double buggy out the front gate it doesn't fit (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's the small things sometimes isn't it the small things it is it really is and like you said so many people have opinions so people are constantly talking to you you should do this you shouldn't do that um 
with the twin thing for anyone else who has twins you probably are aware that for some people they're a sign of good luck so we had people try to hand them silver coins people try to touch them on the head you know there's a lot of superstitions around having twins especially if they are identical and and that was quite quite difficult I got to the point where I actually brought single buggies so that if I had somebody with me not only was it more maneuverable but it was less likely that they would be noticed as being twins <laughs> it's really wow. bad. <laughs> that's, um, also, that's also insightful really isn't it because that's actually how you know not even being able to have and I think that's another thing those boundaries you mm-hmm. know kind of of being able to express when you're a new mum because everyone thinks they can just go in and touch and 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 do all of these different things and yes. yeah I think that being able to kind of express those boundaries without seeming harsh or out of order or you know like oh god she's in a mood <laughs> or any of those but the fact that you had to get two kind of single buggies just to kind of give a a boundary I suppose really isn't it is is crazy but genius <laughs> <laughs> I think also you know there was there was that point where I was like well what is what is a mum supposed to be like what does a mum dress like you know is is there a look I mean these days you tend to find that a lot of mums go for sort of loungewear and messy buns on top of their heads there is a kind of look to a new mum isn't there that you see quite a lot in in style magazines and things like that and on Facebook but I think you know even within that there is an understanding that suddenly you don't have an hour in the morning to do your hair so a messy bun will do you know you don't have time to dress up and 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 who wants somebody you know sicking on your blouse now that you've just put it on you know so actually loungewear that's washable, wearable, tumble dryable, you know, it suddenly it becomes about ease. And I think even just touching on that, it's just triggered a memory. A, a friend I went to school with and he's going to be a dad for the first time. And his biggest fear was he's like, I've always bought expensive clothes like that is my identity. That's who I am. The, the, you know, do I need to go and buy cheap? clothes because I don't want a baby being sick on me and that was the conversation we had at the time I laughed but actually now realistically that mm-hmm. is his identity crisis isn't it really it's like yeah. I don't want a baby being sick on my expensive clothes I mean a little bit vain but anyway <laughs> but that that's him and his identity and who he's always been up until this point so I guess it is a big big part of him and who he is and that I think his kind of outcome at the end of the conversation was that He's going to wear his suits and kind of do him and his expensive clothes and then have something at the front door that he can put on to then become like dad as he kind of then gets home. Yeah. But yeah, big shift in identity. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's an ongoing process because when you you first sort of have a child you are that dyad or in my case triad so you're very very close all of the time but then everything else after that is working towards a kind of separation it's working towards them going off and having their own life and 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 leading that and so actually as you move through those stages you become a different type of mum as well and especially if you then have more children you then throw into the mix their relationships so sibling relationships where sometimes they get on sometimes they just want to tear each other's heads off you know <laughs> yeah and top tip for anyone that's becoming a parent if they go quiet that's when you need to worry <laughs> noise is fine yeah. Noise is fine. You know what they're up to. When they go quiet, they are plotting something. <laughs> what do they say? Silence is deadly. It rings true when the children are involved. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, my two, they used to plot and plan together. There was one morning I woke up in an absolute panic because I looked over and it was nine o'clock and they hadn't woken me up yet. And I was like, oh, my God, something really bad's happened. So I rushed into the next room. Stairgate's still up. No children in the room. 
<laughs> I'm panicking at this point. So I looked down the stairs expecting to see bodies at the bottom of the stairs kind of thing. But no, they'd managed to get downstairs. I got down there to find, because they had eczema, that they got one of the pumps of all of their emollient cream, all their really greasy cream, and had put it all out, all over the laminate flooring. And they were having the best time. They were slipping, they were sliding. It took me six weeks to stop sniffing on that floor, no matter how much washing up liquid I used. And, you know, I can laugh about it now, but at the time I was like, I'm such a terrible mum. How could I have not heard them? But the truth is, one of the things that has never changed about me is the fact that I can sleep through bombs dropping. I really can. I am so terrible. I would have to be, it would be my husband waking me up to feed the baby because I would just sleep through it. I was really, really terrible. So there are some parts of you that, you know, they don't just roll over easily into being a parent. And this idea of there being like a natural mother-child bond that doesn't need to be worked at, or that somehow you're going to have this sixth or seventh sense and know when they're in trouble or know when they're in danger. Nope, sometimes you just sleep through it. <laughs> I'm proof. <laughs> Not sure about sleeping through it for me. I think I could like wake up with a pin drop, but even still, but but yeah, it, it happens ultimately, doesn't it? It definitely happens. And my friend is very much like you, like her her partner literally had to like poke her every time he woke up. It was like, uh, hello. <laughs> but yeah. Absolutely. It's hard work sometimes. But ultimately the identity side of it and that kind of you know, being able to reach out and work with somebody to help you feel empowered, to help you feel that confidence, whether that be within your connection with others or just that connection with yourself again and who you are during that transition mm -hmm. is is just a massive kind of personal growth journey ultimately. And, and I think if only, if only it was in place of a birth plan I think it would be so much more valuable to parents new parents anyway or parents to be expectant mothers absolutely because obviously one of the things we haven't mentioned is the body changes because you go from having this bump that everyone sort of admires and tells you you're glowing and okay you might have some stretch marks underneath they're a bit sore and you've got to put your castor oil on and stuff but you know suddenly you've got this baby you've you've still got the swollen tummy you might be sore you might have stitches you might have had a cesarean you know everything hurts and aches you've used muscles you didn't even realize you had and then suddenly your body's a bit floppy and it's doing all these things that you know it's never done before and that in itself can be quite a shock yeah for sure especially massive shift isn't it a massive massive shift and and yeah. feeling kind of well like you say your bump doesn't necessarily I think sometimes you think oh well, I've had baby that's it I'll bounce back but you've still you know I remember my daughter I'd had baby brought him home and the next morning she come in to meet him and then she was like oh you've still got a bump is there another baby in there I was like mortified <laughs> well that's normal but a, a small child doesn't know does it but um yeah I was just like, oh, thanks. <laughs> Made yeah. me feel better, better about myself. And it was my birthday as well, because I managed to squeeze them out the day before my birthday. And um, so, yeah, I woke up to, oh, you're still fat. <laughs> always, always out of the mouth of babe. Oh, I know. I know. And it's it's so tricky, isn't it? Because when it's it's one thing to kind of have to incorporate this new identity of, of being mum, but you're also incorporating this new version of yourself that is is slightly stretched, it's slightly worn out, it's tired, you know, all of those other things. And so you're readjusting to your own version of yourself. When you look in the mirror, you don't see the person that was there when you were pregnant. This version's slightly more tired, probably got stretch marks slightly swollen belly yeah. you know your shape has changed and that may mean simple things like clothes that you've always worn to show who you are don't fit anymore yeah definitely 
And then what do you do? How do you express yourself? There's so much just in that, isn't there? That might be why lots of new mums wear leggings. Yeah. <laughs> like by the multitude of all sorts at that initial stage. <laughs> Baggy top, leggings, and just then work out kind of how to keep a baby alive first and then and then a new wardrobe kind of when you're feeling a little bit better, I guess, isn't it? And it's a slow, a slow change, I guess, kind of on that finding what fits. Even now, I think, God, nothing fits me properly as it did before. And I've changed again on the second pregnancy. And like now it's... I, I feel like I could literally burn my wardrobe down and start again. <laughs> but it's a never ending transition, isn't it? Never ending. Absolutely. And so when we think about matrescence, don't feel like, you know, you get to sort of four months post birth and then it's done and over. You know, it, it can be an ongoing process to kind of think about and consider at different ages different stages and everything else I mean even empty nest syndrome is a bit of matrescence going on there because you know now we've got to let them fly the nest and that probably if anything marks the end of that that period of time because your relationship drastically changes after that yeah yeah Yeah. my friend experiencing that right now and I think she's a bit lost and just kind of I think what her version of living a bit of freedom but ultimately I think it's that not really knowing what to do and where to go and where that new purpose is and where that lies at the moment. Absolutely and if we can build in sooner that idea that you know they are going to grow apart from us and that it is okay to plan for things then it doesn't suddenly creep up on us. It doesn't suddenly happen. We've already got a few more things in place that we can transition into because transitions can be abrupt and they can be sudden and unexpected. But I really think that forewarned is forearmed. And so the more we talk about this, the more we think about this, the more we think in terms of change and transition and how we're going to manage that, I think the the more comfortable we can be with that absolutely and whether it is kind of you know I have a a parenting Facebook group and it's not necessarily about um what I've got to say it's just about feeling that connection around other people with shared experiences to know that it's not just you you're not isolated and alone in how you're feeling it's like oh oh yeah that, that happened to me too and oh my god yes I can totally relate to that um yeah whether it's kind of as me mentioning slamming doors or whether it's something as simple as kind of I feel a bit lost actually I've now got this baby and who the hell am I (laughs) you know my career and independence is kind of gone and I've lost that kind of control element and now what do I do you know there's lots of other people that are still experiencing the same as you absolutely and and just even saying those words and saying you know I'm, I'm different now things do feel confusing I do feel a bit lost sometimes that's just the first step to to getting that support you need to start rebuilding and creating that life and those relationships that you really will yeah I think um another part of your identity even um is you know kind of your friendship groups those friends that don't necessarily have kids yet and it's a huge transition because they don't really get it and it's again whether we've talked about boundaries earlier you know kind of having those boundaries in place of because they don't understand it's like don't come around and stay all night and drink tea and want to talk to me because actually I'm really tired and I've probably got washing to do or babysit to clean up or nappies or whatever and you need a bit of space because if your baby's sleeping you don't get a lot of it so you need to you know use that time but friends who haven't got children and those that identity as kind of friendship groups very much changes as well doesn't it it does and the shift can be hard because whenever you have to let go of something you know it feels like a loss and yeah we grieve losses and so some yeah. of this transition is going to involve grieving But some of the transition also involves calling in those things that you want, the things that are going to serve you now. And the more clear you are about that, because you are working through your transition actively rather than letting it just happen to you, 
the easier it becomes. We are so good at doing this with our teenagers. We are so good at understanding the trials and tribulations that they face. We need to do the same for for new mums. Yeah, and I suppose talking from my experience, like I'm not a mum that stands at the school gates and natters and I'm not a mum that particularly likes baby groups. Now, I know there's a lot of development there for the babies and I will go to certain things, but I'm not one to kind of meet new people at baby groups because actually if I'm going to baby group, I'm, I'm kind of giving all my attention to my baby and mm. doing what I'm doing rather than trying to have a cup of tea and a conversation with the mums around because it, it's not really comfortable to me. So to even just kind of reach out to something like this and us and, and those kind of groups where it's kind of a different um, group of people, a different experience and not quite, because that isn't my comfort zone. Whereas if I went to a retreat or an event or an online event even, because obviously it's not always easy to get away, you're connecting with different people who might be a bit more like-minded to yourself. Yeah, because just because you've got children that are the same age doesn't automatically mean that you're going to get along it doesn't mean that they're your tribe or your people because you're still somebody who has her own interests her own ideas the own her own things that she likes right so what we need to do is we need to understand that it's it's okay to be more than mum in fact it's actually really healthy to be more than mum I think I'm I'm managing it very well this time round. <laughs> definitely, I definitely book in in the diary me time. And if it is just getting all a bit too much, even I'll go and book in a hotel. Like I'll just say to my other half, like I just need silence, mm. just need space, and I'll book in and go and do that. Or whether it's kind of having a, a girly spa day or whatever it may be, or just lunch or even a cuppa sometimes, isn't it? It's just getting out of the four walls and going and kind of being me in my own reality. And it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. It can be fun. I mean, if we think about our teenagers, you know, and just draw a few parallels there, you know, they often have an identity crisis as well. And you might see them over a period of like two or three years go through different phases. They might be goth one week, emo the next and chat <laughs> with the answer, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they yeah, I've got a 17 year old So, yeah. yes. And a 24 year old. So we've done that one. And actually, I think he's having a new identity at the moment as we speak. Um, And the 17 year old is having Hmm. that kind of phase at the moment. Not allowed to cut his hair. So no, no. (laughs) But they play with it and they have fun with that. And we can do that too. As we begin to find ourselves, it might be that we do try on new styles of clothing it might be that we get ourselves a a new look to go with our slightly new body shape you know it might be that we experiment with different colors it might be that we do all that and decide that we actually liked it the way it was anyway but do you know what it's okay to play you know it's okay to have some fun with it it doesn't have to be doom and gloom all the time does it not at all and it is just the perfect excuse to go and you know treat yourself ultimately isn't it even if it's a new face cream it doesn't have to be just the clothing you know if you're not feeling kind of all kind of there or a nice scented candle to go and have a bath or whatever it might be it's Mm -hmm. kind of lots of ways to enjoy the process absolutely absolutely so I'm thinking that we've we've talked quite a lot today haven't we and if anybody has any questions then please do leave them in the group for us and we will get back to you and answer as many as we can but I think we should probably leave it there for today lovely and just to add obviously in your kind of group side of it if anyone would like to have the Facebook group for the parent inside of it by all means Charlotte you can um, share my details absolutely that would be wonderful all right then so we are going to say goodbye and good night and thank you for joining us 